Liu Changqing, written on New Year's Day. Thoughts of home cut deep on New Year's Day. Alone and tearful, at the end of the earth. Grown old before I can leave this place. Spring after spring, still finds me here. Morning and evening, mountain apes, my companions. I share the wind and mist with willows on the shore. Now I am like Yaji, exiled to Changsha. How many more years till I go home again? So here we have the, I think it's the fifth, yeah. It's uh, the fifth and last of the pentasyllabic regulated poems of Liu Changqing. I think we will still encounter him later on in the anthology. He probably has maybe a heptasyllabic uh, regulated poem or maybe a quatrain as well. I think he has seven poems in the collection, at least, if not a little bit more. So this poem, what is the topic of this poem? Well, it's a topic we've encountered before homesickness, and we won't repeat what we've mentioned in many other poems uh, previous to this. This is a pretty staple topic of classical Chinese poetry. Homesickness is not just Galician Morinha. It, you know, it also has those connotations of uh, being separated from one's roots and, uh, and uh, you know, the, the, the obligations of service or of exile under the empire. Uh, the Confucian moral imperative of being close to your roots and to your family, which is negated by being far away and so on. Yeah. So poems about being far from home are, you know, always <laughs> inevitably dark and pessimistic. And that's not an exception with this poem. So the main topic, homesickness, being away from home, there is a slight, I wouldn't say seasonal, a slightly seasonal element, which the date at which this poem is uh, composed is given, and it's New Year's Day. Now, in the Chinese uh, lunisolar calendar of ancient China, uh, the beginning of the year was uh, in early spring. The late, very late winter, early spring was when the first month started. It's a time of renewal, and uh, it, uh, along with it being the beginning of spring, it's a season that is especially painful or poignant for being far away from home. If one were at home, one would celebrate New Year celebrations with the family, and promises and hopes for renewal and prosperity. But here the poet is alone. One more year emphasizes the passage of time that he has been away from home and in exile. Yeah? And uh, he's not sharing in the flourishing of spring. Remember, spring always comes again in a cycle, but humans, on the contrary, do not follow a cyclical line. Uh, they follow a straight line, and, and they die, and they get old, and there is no reversing the arrow of time. So, no Christmas spirit here. It is a pretty dull uh, surrounding and a pretty dark feelings for the poet. Uh, let's go, well, the, the, I'm not sure where this poem is, when and where uh, Liu Changqing actually wrote this poem, probably in his late years. And uh, he faced a, a couple of, of, of small exiles in, in this area. From what he's saying in the poem, he's probably in the Yangtze River Valley somewhere, which is actually not that far from his home. And uh, he, he is probably mm, close to the big river anyway. Well, let's, uh, let's analyze the poem couplet by couplet, as we usually do. First couplet. Thoughts of home cut deep on New Year's Day, alone and tearful at the end of the earth. So the first poem, as usual, creates the background, and this is a um, chronotopical background, if you wish. The first couplet clearly establishes the time, just as the title did, New Year's Day, and uh, the location, although the location is a bit vague. It's just the typical faraway location in, in Chinese poetry, at the end of the earth. So one would imagine at the frontiers of empire, but I, I don't have reasons to believe that this is exactly so. But anyway, the, po the first couplet, as I say, sets the background. It's New Year. Uh, the poet is feeling homesick and lamenting that he is far from home. 
He is alone and he is far away and he is sad. Second couplet, grown old before I can leave this place, spring after spring still finds me here. So this uh, second couplet goes in the line of what I have just mentioned, the contrast between the cycles of nature and the linear progression of men. Men cannot rejuvenate themselves. Once their spring passes, it's gone forever. And uh, in this province, serving in exile, uh, Liu Changqing has grown old. He, he, he's perhaps exaggerating a bit, but you know he lived a very to a very ripe old age, and he suffered small stints of exile in that retired old age. Moment he recovered from them, he was again employed. Uh, but anyway, the image that is being transmitted is a very typical one, almost stereotypical one in Chinese poetry. That is the poetic persona languishing and uh, becoming old in the faraway frontiers in the service of the empire or being punished, suffering the punishments. So spring after spring, the seasons renew, but spring after spring, I am still here with no change except growing older and more decrepit. Third couplet. So the third couplet mm, gives us a little bit of an insight at the surroundings, the natural surroundings of uh, the poetic persona. It's very generic, but, but specific enough to seem to be pointing to, the, to some part of the Jiangsu River area. Morning and evening, mountain apes, my companions. I share wind and mist with willows on the shore. So we're close to the river, you know, because the poet says that he shares the wind and the mist with the willows. So he is close to the water, but still it's mountainous country. Uh, maybe Zhejiang, I'm not sure, but uh, that's the eastern coast of China. Uh, monkeys, uh, mountain apes are a typical staple fare of Chinese poetry, and they connote sadness. Their cries in, 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 the, in the jungle or in the forests are meant to be a sad sound that evokes melancholy thoughts. So uh, we have, this is a pluralistic couplet, like the previous one. So we have uh, oral images, not explicitly, it says the mountain apes are my companions, but probably the sound of the mountain apes, uh, the mountain apes crying is, is, is meant to, to, to indicate this companionship. Also, they're not human, of course. Uh, the poet does not enjoy the company of other humans. This would seem to imply that the location at which he's staying is not, you know, a, a town or a village, but, you know, some some remote and uh, hardly peopled region. And uh, only animals live there. And willows. So he has only the company of elements of nature, of trees and animals. Yeah? And wind and mist, you know, phenomenons of nature from morning till evening. So he's alone all the time. Remember, loneliness is not a pleasant thing for a Chinese scholar official. In our romantic tradition, uh, poets sometimes like to be alone, relish loneliness, but uh, the scholar official does not. He, his poetry, his life is oriented towards a social sphere. Um, Confucian values are mainly social values, acting in the world, improving the world. And from a more uh, materialistic point of view, scholar officials enjoyed the company of people who knew them, people who shared the same cultural background, uh, the same high culture and refinement, people with whom they could enjoy the, the pleasures of the scholarly elite, like playing chess or uh, reading and reciting poetry or, or appreciating art or discussing on the welfare of the empire. But no, our friend is alone. The last couplet, in fact, synthesizes this idea of the loneliness and the, 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 the suffering in exile, but it also gives us a historical exemplar. Uh, which I think we've talked about before in some other poem. Now I am like Jiaji, exiled to Changsha. How many more years till I go home again? So the president that, being, that is being quoted, Jiaji, Jiaji was a writer and a politician of the early Western Han Dynasty, so around 200, 180, 70, before the Common Era. And uh, he had given some advice to the emperor, on practical policies. I think it was to the Han Emperor Wen, uh, especially defending a more centralized and stronger central government. And uh, so uh, those who did not agree with those policies conspired. He was also very young, 
And uh, that, that probably made uh, older councillors feel unhappy with the, with the boldness and directness and uh, haughtiness, perhaps, of G.I.G.'s comments. So they managed to get him semi-exiled. He was sent as councillor to the king or to the heir of the kingdom of Changsha. The kingdom of Changsha was um, for the Han Dynasty in the remote south, in, in the region, the southern region below the, the, Jiangsu, the middle course of the Jiangsu River Valley. And it was a dangerous place at this time too because uh, uh, the, that was a swampy region, hot swampy region infested with insects, uh, uh, poisonous animals, malaria. And uh, in fact, Jia Ji wrote some, some texts in exile talking about his impending death and he did die there in exile in that uh, miasmatic region. So he became an exemplar of a, a good scholar official exiled and dying in exile. So he's a very common image, whether directly or indirectly quoted in poems in which uh, scholar officials think they are exiled or are playing at uh, being an exiled uh, person. So here Liu Changqing says, I am like him, but unlike him, he hopes to return. He still has some hopes left. How many more years till I go home again? Uh, you could say that this poem is not just uh, a complaint. It's probably, um, you know, asking for redress. It's a, a typical, very poetic, very indirect way of begging, of asking the emperor or whoever may read the poem to, you know, get him back home again so that he won't end up like Yaji. Okay, so not a bad poem. Uh, a bit conventional, but that, that's something that is frequently mentioned uh, of classical Chinese poetry we can't really judge it with criteria of originality because uh, that's a very Western construct. I mean, they, in general, classical Chinese poetry does not favor too much original subject matter or new ways of expression. It, on the contrary, it tends to feed and even fester on evoking uh, previous poems and the feelings of previous poems and uh, images and quotations and allusions to previous poetry. Now, this is not necessarily a bad thing. We're not going to discuss this now. The, the tradition among translators of uh, Chinese poetry to the West, at least until very into the 20th century, was to avoid poems with many allusions and to dislike allusions, to consider this as a sign of decadence. And this is obviously a simplistic interpretation. Bearing in mind the small size of these poems that we are reading, of these pentasyllabic uh, Liu Xi, and it will be even more evident in the quatrains, um, making reference to allusions to very common images and topics of the tradition allows the poem to say more with less words because just, just naming Jiaji evokes all the story of the scholar official exile, dying in exile, writing poems lamenting his fate, being afraid of dying young. You know, it expands the meanings and the resonance of the poems without having to expand the words. And, uh, you know, it can be used expressively. It's not just... Uh, um, Mm, it's not just a, a lazy trope. <coughs> and besides this, I, I think I've also already mentioned that poetry, writing poetry, reciting poetry, was one of the elements that showed that you were a scholar official. So it was group membership and uh, it's making quotes that reference to the corpus of texts that you have to study to pass the examinations also indicates that you're part of the group that you, you know, you know, you've studied, you know the same texts as the others. So, so uh, there's a social element in, in, in uh, excessive, from our point of view, allusions in Chinese poetry. But anyway, a bit of a, as I was saying, a bit of a conventional poem, but okay, I think it transmits very well the sadness at being alone in a new year and far from home.